Well, I'm, uh, I'm certainly uh, encouraged that uh, the energy level is so high. So we'll see uh, how this goes. Uh, welcome to the lecture on uh, subjective value and market prices. Uh, we'll do three things in this uh, uh, time. Uh, first, uh, what we want to do is talk about uh, some of the fundamentals of human action. Um, this is what I uh, mentioned uh, last uh, night in uh, saying that um, the Austrian school has a particular way of developing the insights uh, from the marginalist revolution uh, that were not uh, mimicked uh, in the neoclassical school. The second thing we'll do is we'll talk about uh, the Caruso economy. This is a very important uh, thought experiment in economics because <clears throat> we use it to show how far the process of what we'll call valuation can extend in economizing the use of resources in society. This has direct uh, implication for our democratic socialist uh, friends' uh, uh, you know, ambitions uh, to have some uh, czar run the entire economy. And then the third thing we'll do is the uh, development of the theory of price itself. We'll show exactly how uh, we can go from these fundamental principles to explaining uh, market prices. And then this will be the foundation for other lectures that uh, will be upcoming on uh, entrepreneurship and uh, allocation of resources and so on. <clears throat> uh, so let's start in the fundamentals. Um, we'll begin with just the definition of human action as purposeful behavior, as Murray Rothbard uh, likes to put it. Um, action is designed to attain an end. The, the attainment of the end is the motive for action. So every human action is motivated uh, by the desire to attain the end. We recognize uh, right away, though, uh, that having an end, simply saying in our minds uh, we wish to attain something, uh, does not suffice to attain it. We make a distinction, in other words, between ends and means because we're finite beings and we can't will things simply to, uh, to occur. <clears throat> Uh, we also notice right away that um, when we apply means to the attainment of ends, uh, the fulfillment of our ends can be inadequate. It can be uh, uh, not complete. Uh, it can be temporary, or it could be uh, uh, just not as full as we thought it would be. So, f for example, uh, this morning when I uh, got up and I went down to the uh, little coffee shop in the hotel, <clears throat> and I uh, wanted uh, to uh, get uh, some caffeine to start the day. So um, I ordered a double espresso, right? And I have my end, yeah? So I'm, I'm energetic as well <laughs> with the rest of you. And um, so I had my end to uh, fulfill, and then I couldn't just, you know, think in my mind, boy, I'd like to have, have that end fulfilled. I have, I have to act towards the attainment of this end by applying means to the attainment of the end. And then, and then I find, of course, after uh, the day drags on a little while, that it, it doesn't, you know, this uh, double espresso doesn't permanently satisfy my end. It has to be refreshed uh, uh, once again. So this is the idea, this is where we get to the idea, of course, of the scarcity of means, so our means are scarce. Uh, when they're scarce, then it follows logically that we must choose in action. So. We have two parameters of choice since they're ends and means. With given means, we have to choose uh, which ends to pursue that the means are capable of attaining. And uh, for a given end, uh, we have to choose the combination of means that we might employ, again, that are suitable to the attainment of the end um, from among the uh, possible combinations. <clears throat> uh, this is where we get then to the principle of economizing. So human action is always economizing because the way in which we make our choices with respect to ends and means is always in accordance with the uh, purposes that we have. Or as uh, I pointed out uh, in making my remark about Caruso, uh, that we engage in valuation. We, we value uh, the attainment of the end in a certain way or the use of the means uh, to attain ends in a certain way. It's this principle of economizing. It's once we see the fact that, uh, as human beings, we're economizing, that gives structure and order to action. It wouldn't be possible to do economic analysis if there wasn't some order or structure to human action that we're analyzing. 
and this is the principle from which uh, that that structure and order comes. <clears throat> Now, when we say that we economize according to uh, valuation, uh, we get to the next principle, which is, since we're making a choice, we must rank order the alternatives. We must say the double espresso is worth more to me than the alternative, say a cup of coffee or a glass of orange juice or whatever else might have gone through my mind at the time of my choice. <clears throat> we choose what we value more highly. We set aside what we value less highly. This uh, we call preferring. So this is what we mean uh, in the literature by preference. <clears throat> now this preference obviously that I have for the double espresso or that you would have for whatever action you take is demonstrated in the action. So if you would have seen me in the coffee shop this morning uh, buying the espresso, uh, then you could have inferred from that act that I preferred it to the alternative that I could have engaged in uh, with the means that I expended. Right? So we know something as observers about hu other people's human action uh, just by observation. <clears throat> now we get to the uh, principle uh, where we start to see some separation between the Austrians and the neoclassical school. And this is on the subjectivity of value. <clears throat> and here, because the Austrians are interested in doing a realist assessment of human action. In other words, we want to start with real human beings. And when we begin to uh, talk about these fundamental principles of human action, you can see right away that how they apply to your own uh, lives and the action you take and so on. They're just uh, almost commonsensical, right, once it's laid out um, uh, for us to see. Whereas in the neoclassical school, they don't start this way at all. Some of you know uh, all about this. They start with fictitious economic agents, and they stipulate, uh, stipulate for the economic agents what their utility functions are right? Uh, that uh, may or may not have anything directly to do. It certainly don't spring logically, at least, uh, from a real human action of real persons. So if we're going to stick to real human persons and we want to talk about the subjectivity of value, what, uh, what uh, are we referring to? What is the reference that we're making? <clears throat> and here the idea is that when we engage in action, we make a personal judgment of value. This is what we're referring to when we talk about subjectivity. <coughs> subjectivity is a mental judgment that's made by the person acting. It's a state of mind. As a state of mind or a judgment of the mind, uh, it has no extensive property. It just exists in our mind. This is what we mean by subjective, fundamentally. <clears throat> if it just exists in our mind and has no extensive property, then we cannot define a unit of subjective value. We cannot measure subjective value because there's no way to um, even conceive of what a, a unit would be that, for which we could have a shared objective knowledge. It's just no such thing, right? If I were to tell you when I drank my double espresso this morning, I got 10 units of value, this would just be something like a nonsense statement. How would you know what one unit of value is to me? You might have a notion of what one unit of value is to you in drinking a glass of orange juice, but you see, we, we, we can't have a shared experience of what those units are. And so we can't engage in anything like um, arithmetic operations with value. We can't compare interpersonally the value of one person. Or we can't do this directly with the value of another person. Now, this, this uh, feature of value that we call subjectivity is different from another feature of value that we can also ascertain just by thinking about human action at this kind of fundamental level. And this second principle of valuation is that value is not constant. And by this, we mean that there is no constant quantitative relationship between external circumstances that influence the way that I value things and the value that uh, uh, is produced by my mind. <clears throat> this, by the way, is a different proposition than the proposition of whether or not uh, if you watch me uh, during the week, if you watch me every morning as I got up and I went down to the coffee shop and whether or not I, I would ha always get espresso. Th this would be my intention, by the way, so if you just did. So you don't have to follow me around to find this out. <laughs> That'd be a little creepy anyway. 
<laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but the point is, there, uh, th that's a different question from the point we're making here. The point we're making here is there isn't any quantitative relationship between my external circumstances, how much money I have, I happen to be in the hotel, and so on and so forth, all these external circumstances, and the way that I value the espresso, the, the, the sort of connection between those two things. Uh, again, in contrast, in the neoclassical school, their utility functions, which, which do accept this assumption, right? they're economic agents that have utility functions, but functions have constants and variables. And so they're assuming that there's some kind of a constant relationship between the external circumstances, how much money I have, what the price of the espresso is, how hot it is, and so on and so forth, and the way that I value it. So uh, Austrians rule that out uh, from the beginning. Uh, it follows from our discussion also that costs of action are fundamentally subjective, just like value. The cost of uh, my obtaining the espresso was the subjective value to me of the alternative use of the means, uh, which I forego when I uh, bought the uh, espresso. And then it also follows that profit, the net gain of an action, is also fundamentally subjective. It's in my mind. I'm just making a value comparison between the value to me of the espresso, the value to me of the alternative uh, good that I could have had with the uh, same means. <clears throat> Uh, so we see fundamentally all of these concepts uh, that we can readily ascertain just by a little bit of uh, reflection concerning human action. Now, one last uh, principle, and we're going to diagram this just so it becomes clear uh, as what we're uh, referring to. <clears throat> we haven't yet talked about what uh, Carl Menger liked to call the order of goods. So when I go to get the espresso, the espresso to me is a consumer good because I can directly... Uh, apply it in action to the attainment of my end. But that consumer good has to be made in a process of production by producer goods. So there's the espresso machine and the beans and the, um, and the employee who, uh, who so kindly made my espresso and uh, so on and so forth, right? All the means of, of production. <clears throat> so if value is in our mind, I have this value for the espresso in my mind, then uh, how does this value relate to the order of goods? How does the value relate to the consumer good? And then from the consumer good, how does the value relate to the producer good? So the top line contains the Austrian theory uh, of imputed value or imputation. Since, since all action is in an ends-means relationship, it's the value of the ends that is primary. The value of the ends drives the value of everything else. So the value uh, of an action starts in my mind, given the circumstances of my situation, right? It starts in my mind, and then I place value on the consumer good, the arrow of causality. And then because I place value on the consumer good, value will be placed on the producer good because I'm buying the espresso and other people are buying espresso. Then this justifies the purchase of the machine and the labor expense for the, uh, uh, the worker and so on and so forth. Right, so this is the Austrian theory of the relationship between subjective value in the mind and the value that is attached to the orders of goods. Now, the second row contains a, a what we might call a cost of production theory. So this, uh, many of you know, uh, was held by the British classical school, uh, the school, the reigning school of thought that was overturned by the marginalist revolution. And there the argument was that Factors of production have costs uh, inherent to them. It's like they have certain other objective properties like uh, color and mass and energy and so on, in particular cases, right, of different producer goods. They also have value. And through production, this value accumulates and then is transferred to the consumer good. So the arrow of causality is turned around. And then from the consumer good, our mind a sense to that value, right? We say, oh yeah, th I see that the good is worth that because it, it uh, uh, has this particular price, you know, or particular uh, a producer uh, 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 goods embedded in it. So this, uh, this is what the uh, marginalist, revo this theory is what the marginalist revolution overturned. And then the bottom, the bottom row, <coughs> the bottom row is, a, uh, is the neoclassical theory which argues that the consumer goods value or price is 
mutually determined by the subjective value in the minds of the consumers and the cost of production. Now, we're not going to go into detail about this uh, the debate between the schools uh, uh, right at this point. I just want to note that if one reasons this way, one has abandoned this ends means uh, connection that we've spoken about. Uh, because to reason this way, one has to say there must be some independent, independent from the mind, there must be some independent value for the producer good. That it's not dependent on the mind. Or, or you have to have some, or, uh, some other way of connecting these disparate factors. And again, we're not going to talk in detail about that. It raises other sorts of issues that... Uh, uh, hopefully it will come up uh, during the week in, in uh, questions and so on. I just want to point out it's a different, it's clearly different from the Austrian view. <clears throat> okay, so now let's turn to the second uh, part of the lecture. And uh, here we want to talk about the Caruso economy. It's what Ludwig von Mises calls the autistic economy, the economy where there's only one person, right? Uh, interestingly, uh, I, I remember being sort of taken aback when I first read this in uh, Human Action, uh, where Mises also categorizes socialism as an autistic economy. I thought, wow, that's, that's really provocative. That's very interesting. Aren't there a whole bunch of people? You know, I mean, how, how, how does he get that? And, uh, of course, the answer is quite straightforward. You, know, you read a little bit, you see what, he, what he's getting at, which is that in socialism, only one will acts. Only the central planning will is put into motion. Right? That's the whole notion of a central plan. We're all, the rest of us are just pawns on the chessboard. Right? And we're told what to do. And only the central planners act, right? choose, you know, value and choose and uh, uh, assign uh, means to ends and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so, this is the, this, so this is a very interesting question for us. We're not, of course, interested in Caruso economics, just because, you know, there are a whole bunch of isolated people in the world that we're trying to figure out how they're going about their daily lives. Uh, we're interested in this question of the autistic economy. How far can the valuation in the mind of Caruso extend to the use of resources uh, to integrate them in an economizing way into production processes that satisfy his consumptive ends? That's the question we're trying to answer. How far can the mind of OAC extend to all of us to incorporate us into a single system of economizing, that is, production that uh, satisfies the highest valued ends that we have, economizing system of the division of labor. Hmm. I'll bet she's never thought about that. <laughs> uh, okay, well, well, so we're going to think about that. And we're going to do this. Uh, first, let's uh, start with uh, Caruso's valuation of consumer goods. And then we'll do producer goods. And this is just a stylistic example to, to illustrate, again, the, the uh, important uh, principles that uh, we can develop from thinking about Caruso's situation. So let's suppose that Caruso has two consumer goods on his island that he can directly produce. That is, just with his labor, he can extract them from nature. One is uh, coconuts, so he can uh, climb coconut trees and gather coconuts. And the other is berries that he can pick off bushes. And so we'll just start at the simple level. And here are his preference. Here's a, uh, again, stylistic uh, illustration of what his preferences might look like. And uh, on the left uh, side, we've got uh, the rank of marginal utilities, so the MU for marginal utilities, for different units of coconuts. <clears throat> now here, we can see right away that, that we have an analytical uh, a problem, an analytical uh, issue in front of us, which is how do we even define the unit of a good? We could define it in a technical way. Coconuts come in you know, one unit sizes, right? We could define it in a technical way. But that's not sufficient for economic analysis. That's just one aspect of uh, Caruso's situation, right? The other aspect is how, how does Caruso see, perceive the usefulness of the coconuts in the attainment of his consumptive ends? And the answer is, well, he might actually uh, want more than one coconut to attain an end. Or he might uh, want just uh, part of a coconut to attain an end. 
This is a choice variable for him. He's not limited by just the technical facts of his environment. He can um, combine them in different ways. So let's say that his unit of uh, action is two coconuts. So again, that's just arbitrary. I'm just making that up uh, just to have an example. Let's say two coconuts then is sufficient for him to satisfy his uh, highest valued end, which is drinking the coconut milk. Now, once he does that, he satisfied that ends that end. And if he has more coconuts, if he has four coconuts, those additional two would have to be put to some end that's less valuable to him. But just by definition, right? Because the unit of the good is the amount of the good that satisfies the end to which he's putting it. We define it that way because that's relevant for action. Right? So that's why the second unit of two coconuts is lower ranked. And let's say he uses this for eating. He, you know, you can mash up the coconut meat and eat it. <clears throat> and then an even lower ranked end might be something like um, he takes two more coconuts and stores them in a cave and you know, he, uh, consumes them in the future. So something like this. So he rank orders the different units of good in succession, logically we're saying, in succession. <clears throat> uh, this, of course, then uh, gets us the uh, laws of utility. So we can, we can immediately see that there are certain principles involved here that are universally applicable to all human action. <clears throat> and we call these the laws of utility. Uh, the first law, the larger the stock of the good, the lower the value of the marginal unit. <clears throat> and the second law, the larger, a larger stock of a good is preferred to a smaller stock of a good. Right. These are always true. We'll see that this is important when we make the jump to uh, analyzing prices. So hopefully you can see right away, or you've uh, already been trained in this, right, that the laws of supply and demand come directly from these laws of utility. Uh, okay, so we can do the same thing with uh, berries or any other good, right? It would be the same principle that we would uh, use to analyze this. <clears throat> now let's move to production. Or excuse me, let's uh, take one more step here in thinking about how Caruso would allocate his consumptive activity between two different goods. So yes, the laws of utility apply to each good, but Caruso is not faced with just thinking about, oh, what am I going to do with coconuts? What am I going to do with berries over here? Is a different set of actions. He's going to integrate everything. That's the point. He's going to think, you know, I can do all these different consumptive acts. H how do I allocate across them? And the answer is he allocates uh, according the economizing principle. Uh, he allocates uh, to the highest marginal utility consumptive act first, logically first, then he exhausts that, and then he goes to the next highest valued consumptive act, and then he exhausts that, right, he consumes and meets that end, and then to the third one, then to the fourth, then to the fifth and the sixth. <clears throat> and how does this re result then in an um, integration of uh, coconut consumption with berry consumption? And the answer is uh, Caruso will continue to consume these two goods, or all the goods that uh, Crusoe uh, consumes so that there are no big value differences left between the marginal utilities of the different goods. He'll extend his consumption to each good so that he can't see that it's advantageous to shift uh, the last unit of that consumption to another good which would have a greater marginal utility. So on my example, he, once he, once he uh, drinks the two coconuts, that uh, using the second unit of coconuts is not very valuable to him. And so this allows berries to come in as his second consumptive act and so on and so forth. <clears throat> Again, hopefully you're, you're making the transition to social life. You can see the same principle will occur in social life. Right. Now let's go to production real quickly. And here again, we, uh, we stipulate uh, something for analysis uh, that's relevant to Caruso's action, which is when Caruso is engaged in production of the coconuts and production of the berries, he has a fixed set of complementary factors of production. He's got the coconut trees on the island. And then he can add more and more of his labor to that fixed set of complementary factors of production. And we can analyze any production process this way, then, even if it involves highly uh, advanced capital goods. <clears throat> we have a fixed set of factors of production, and then we're going to add more and more of a variable factor to it. <clears throat> so when Caruso does this, he, uh, he'll find the uh, uh, law of returns. 
you'll find, in other words, that uh, at some point, as he adds more and more units of the variable factor, in this case labor, the additional amount of output that he gets diminishes. And this, again, is because the complementary factors of production have finite productive capacity. Again, we live in a finite world, and, and therefore production is finite. We can't just you know, uh, snap our fingers and produce whatever we want. And so we get diminishing uh, marginal physical product for additional units of labor added to uh, the coconut trees or the berry bushes. Uh, you know, to make this a little bit more concrete uh, for Caruso, <clears throat> Caruso would find on the island that the coconuts are distributed in trees in different ways. So there, he's got a shelter, let's say, in a cave nearby, and then there's a coconut grove nearby. And in the coconut grove nearby, there are coconuts on the ground, there are coconuts in short trees, tall trees, there are lush coconut trees, there are sparse coconut trees, and so on. If he's economizing, and his goal is just to produce coconuts, he'll pick up coconuts on the ground first. And then he'll go to the less productive production possibilities. So move this way. And again, in social life, it's the same way. We do the same kind of allocating in, in uh, or uh, land resources and so on in social uh, division of the labor. Uh, so same thing with berries, right? We get this, this same principle. And then we want to integrate um, how Caruso would uh, then value and allocate his uh, production, his, his labor in production, to these different possibilities. So now we're integrating his consumption principles with his production principles. This is what... Um, uh, in economics, we call the marginal value product of his labor. It's the additional output he can produce from additional unit of labor, then the value to him of that output. So for Caruso, he, he values, uh, with the first unit of the labor, he values most highly the six coconuts that he can get by uh, gathering up coconuts. But you'll notice that the second, if he were to apply another unit of labor to coconuts, it would not be very valuable to him. It's the last ranked item, right? fifth coconut, uh, five coconuts for his, uh, another unit of labor to coconuts. So instead, he allocates towards berries. And then as he does that, the marginal value product of additional labor in berry production goes down. And then he again brings into rough equality the marginal value product of the different uh, output that he can produce with labor. Uh, by the way, and this is true in social life, right? Social life in a division of labor, we have all these workers and they have to be... Uh, allocated into different production processes. How, how does this happen in the market? It happens through this equimarginal principle, right? Through economizing uh, uh, the, the principle of, uh, the, the same principle that Caruso uses. <clears throat> uh, okay, so now we're at the point where we can uh, proceed to the theory of price. Uh, let me just reiterate uh, the, the conclusion that we arrived at here with Caruso. What we've tried to show with Caruso is, uh, briefly, is that Caruso can extend through his own mental processes of intelligence and valuing and so on. He can extend his uh, economizing activity to a certain degree. But he has to be able to have personal experience with all the different production processes and consumptive goods and so on and so forth. He has to at least be able to anticipate that he would have personal experience with all these things in order to value them in, in a uh, relevant way with respect to his action. So his economy extends as far as his personal activity can extend and as far as he can integrate things uh, it, uh, into the value of other things that he's doing. Let me just give you one more uh, illust illustrative example of this. Let's suppose Caruso wants to catch fish in a stream, but he can't do it directly. He can't do it with his bare hands. So he thinks, maybe with some of the material on the island, I can fashion a net, and then I can use the net to snag the fish. So then he has to integrate a capital structure in, in, into right, an intertemporal structure of production uh, into the more direct production that he's already engaged in. He can do this. Right? He, would just, he would just keep going right, and extend his uh, domain of his economy uh, in this way. But there are limits. And, and that, this is the point. <clears throat> so now what we want to do is turn again to the theory of price. And again, the setup here is 
valuation of Caruso or any person, Solomon, AOC, it wouldn't matter who the person is, can only extend so far in integrating into an economizing arrangement the use of factors of production to produce goods that uh, satisfy the highest value consumptive ends. <clears throat> uh, this, is a, this is a conceptual problem, right? It's not, it's not that if someone were born with uh, a special person that they could do this. It, it, it's a conceptual problem with the limitation of the human person. <clears throat> so let's say that Caruso comes into the division of labor and he opens up a bakery. And now, in order to integrate his productive activity into the social nexus, he needs to discover what is valuable to his customers. Not, because he's not going to consume his own baked goods. He's going to exist uh, or produce in the division of labor where his production is done to satisfy the consumptive ends of other people. But as we've seen, the subjectivity of value means he cannot experience the subjective value of other people. He can't, he can't get into their heads. He can't mind meld with them. Uh, he's not a Vulcan. And so he can't do this, right, and have a shared experience of what you know, the value of a croissant is to this person or the value of a loaf of bread is to that person. He, he's, he's stuck conceptually here. <clears throat> um, and the same, the same problem exists uh, if, if he tries to think of, well, who should I hire to, you know, where should I get the workers to uh, be bakers? with me and uh, cleaners of the uh, equipment and so on and so forth. He, he can't get into the heads to share knowledge of the opportunity cost of the different persons who might come into this employment so that he can minimize that opportunity cost. Like he can do on the island when he's by himself. He can do that because the opportunity cost is in his head. But the opportunity cost for you and me is not in the head of, o, of AOC. And, and it cannot be in her head. Right? Uh, so we've got this problem. And that's why the theory of price is so important because it shows us how this problem is solved and how we can have a division of labor economy that is in fact economizing where all production decisions are left to um, the group of entrepreneurs who can then economize on the basis of uh, market prices. Now, this is, a theory, this is the schematic of the theory of price, and I, I put this out so that you can have a kind of framework because we can only sort of give an overview of how this all works, and there are obvious some, uh, some uh, nuances that you might have questions about. So we begin with preferences, and then preferences that people have uh, uh, lead them to demand, like my espresso, right? I demand the espresso. I show a willingness to pay money to obtain the espresso, and then there are others who prefer the money to the espresso. And so we can make a mutually advantageous trade, and we can ag agree on the price, on the terms of trade. Right? So that gets us the prices of consumer goods. The prices of consumer goods then generate revenue for the entrepreneur. It's expense to me when I buy the uh, espresso, but it's revenue to the coffee shop. And that revenue then is a causal factor in the demand that the entrepreneur has to buy the factors of production. It's one of the causal factors, not the only one, but uh, uh, an essential causal factor. And <clears throat> so the arrow of causality goes from revenue for the entrepreneurs to the, to the entrepreneur's demand for the producer goods. But of course, the uh, coffee shop owner isn't the only entrepreneur demanding labor. It would be demanded by other entrepreneurs providing other things to other consumers uh, where the labor is uh, transferable between these different activities. And so we get a market, and we get an overall demand for the uh, producer goods, and then prices for these producer goods. And the prices of producer goods then in turn generate costs for the entrepreneur. So there's a wage to hire this labor in the market, and then the coffee shop owner has to pay this wage, right? Now the coffee shop owner can compare the revenue streams from customers, satisfying customers' preferences with the cost structures that uh, represent the opportunity cost, the monetary expression of the opportunity cost for drawing those resources into the coffee shop production and out of the alternative. The entrepreneur has to bid those resources away from other entrepreneurs and so pay the cost that's given up in other production that's not done because I'm such a coffee hound 
And, uh, you know, I have this tremendous demand for coffee. <laughs> uh, okay, so with that as an overview, let's go through uh, some of the nuts and bolts of this. And let's start, so this is the first set of arrows from preferences to demand and supply for the consumer good. And let's start with a, uh, a used consumer good. And the good that I've chosen here is a 2007, 17 um, iPhone 10. So it's a two-year-old iPhone 10, just for sale on eBay or someplace, right? That's the idea. And so we have someone who might be interested in, well, we have actual person who goes into this market and buys the iPhone 10, the two-year-old iPhone 10, right? There are people actually selling and buying them now. So we have this person, and this person, we as economists could analyze this person's action by thinking of a preference rank. What the person is doing, of course, is saying, I value the iPhone 7 more than $650. And so, look, I bought it. I acquired the iPhone, and I paid the $650. So we know that the that buyer preferred the iPhone at that moment to the $650. Then, as economists, we can infer that only at lower prices would this person have purchased a greater quantity of iPhones. At some lower price, well, maybe he wouldn't uh, purchase more, but he certainly would not purchase less. In other words, if the price would have been $550 instead of $650, he would have bought the iPhone even more happily than, than he did. But it, it's, it's sort of an interesting question as to why he buys this first iPhone if the price is $650 but he doesn't buy another one. He, there's more than one for sale on eBay. Why does he just buy another one? And the answer must be that he values the second one less highly. Otherwise, he would just buy the second one, and then the third, and the fourth, and the fifth, and, right? If there was no change in the marginal utility of these iPhones. So that's what the economist is saying, right? There's a, the, the, the uh, laws of utility restrict the amount that uh, each buyer buys. But if prices were lower, there could be an increased quantity demanded by various buyers. So we get the quantity demand schedule, right? This is just the analytical apparatus of the economist. And then we could do the same thing with supply. Same thing is true of uh, those who are supplying the, these used iPhones. They're just consumers who bought them a couple years ago, and now they want to upgrade or whatever, and they're selling their iPhones. And so they, they have the same kind of a preference arrangement, right? Suppose we have a person now who owns two of these iPhones, well, then uh, be, this person would be willing to sell one, the second one, the least valuable one, for $550. And so that's where we get the first entry is supply. So we see somebody doing this. And then as economists, we say, look, that person preferred getting the $550 to the continued use, uh, the value of the use of the iPhone. Otherwise, they wouldn't have made this trade, right? They're demonstrating their preference. And then we can infer that if this person owned more than one iPhone, if they still had one, that that iPhone could only be bid away from that person at a higher price. At least conceptually, this would be possible, right? And so we get the law of supply that at higher prices, uh, ceteris paribus, uh, the quantities offered for sale would be larger. But the law of demand says that only at lower prices will the quantity uh, offered to be purchased be larger. So you can see that the, these, these two behaviors will only be consistent at some intermediate price, right? And so that's where we get uh, the theory of price. So let's add a couple more buyers, a couple more sellers, just to have some competitive bidding and offering in this market. So, so it's more like a real market. And we can see in my stylistic example that the market clearing price, the price where the quantity demand, quantity supply are the same, it turns out to be $600. So what, what uh, Austrian economists are arguing is this. If we looked at, you know, we got onto eBay and we looked and we saw this price, we saw trade occurring at this price, or we go, you know, in any market, we, get, we go to, I go to the coffee shop and I pay uh, $4 for the double espresso, we see an actual price and trade taking place, <clears throat> then our analysis is saying that that price is, in fact, market clearing. That price is the price at which quantity demand and quantity supply are the same. Why is this logically so? This is logically so because at any other price, there would be dissatisfied buyers or dissatisfied sellers. At any other price, at a higher price, there'd be some sellers who could not find buyers, and yet some of those sellers are willing to sell at a lower price. That's what the uh, law of supply says. 
And therefore, they would just, if, if they couldn't make their sale, they would just cut their price and, and then uh, attract a, a buyer. And the same way with the buyers. Uh, the buyers don't offer prices below the market clearing price. I didn't, when I went to the coffee shop and I found the price was $4, I didn't say, well, would you take three? I'm not, you know, I'm just kind of a little short today. You know, no, no, no. They, would, they would just say, well, take a hike. Right? Get out of here. There's a, there's a disjunction between quantity demand and quantity supplied at that price. I was perfectly willing to pay $4. So I just upped a bit. I mean, I, didn't, I don't even try this, right? Because it's a waste of my effort. It's not economizing for me to try this sort of thing. So it's not economizing for people to do that sort of thing. It's economizing for them to meet and trade at the market clearing price. And that's why that price rules in the market. This is the Austrian argument. Uh, once again, we can make a clear distinction here between the Austrian view of all of this and the neoclassical. The neoclassical um, uh, system is not designed to explain actual prices in markets. It's designed to explain equilibrium prices in the far away by and by. Right? Prices as they would emerge if all mutually advantageous activity simultaneously happened or that would emerge if all uh, adjustment processes in the market were finally taken, you know, some hundreds of years in the future, something like that. They're trying to explain those sorts of prices. <coughs> um, Austrian uh, economics, we're trying to explain actual prices in the market. We're trying to explain those prices because these are the relevant prices for entrepreneurs to economize, actual entrepreneurs to economize their production decisions right now in markets. That's that's the whole point of economic analysis. Explain what entrepreneurs are doing right now, what workers are doing right now, what consumers are doing right now in markets, to explain the actual economy as it, uh, as it exists. <clears throat> now, uh, one last point on this, and I'll make some quick remarks about, uh, about uh, producer prices. We can generalize now the uh, categories, so to speak, the logical structure of demand and supply this way. Uh, the preferences of the buyers, of course, uh, they value this, uh, the good obtained, so I value my, the espresso that I got. And then we can categorize the two alternative, the opportunity costs, alternatives to, to any person, as either the uh, continuing use of what I give up, so I could have just kept my money and then, and then held on to it and gotten that value from holding money, or I could have spent it for something else. So I have money, I can either hold on to it or I can spend it. When I spend it, I can either spend it to one vendor or another vendor. Those, those are the uh, categories of uh, choice. And then it's the same with the supply. So the coffee shop owner has the coffee. The coffee shop owner can keep the coffee for personal use. It's highly unlikely in a division of labor, right? Uh, I'll meet some of the coffee, but not, not all of their coffee would they keep. Uh, they could sell it to me, or they could say, well, I think if somebody's going to come in at 10 o'clock and pay a better price, I'll just, I'll just wait and sell it to someone else. Right? They can keep it for themselves. They can sell it to somebody. They can sell it to me. They can sell it to someone else. Right? These are the logical possibilities. <clears throat> now, because this exhausts the logical possibilities, uh, hopefully you can see right away that it doesn't matter uh, whether or not the good being sold and supplied is newly produced, has just been produced, like the coffee, um, the espresso, right? <clears throat> or it was a used good, like my example of the two-year-old iPhone. Because once the good is produced, then the opportunity cost uh, for the seller is exactly, uh, reduces exactly down to these possibilities, right? Once the good is produced. So costs of production have no causal impact on the prices of consumer goods, at least not in this kind of direct uh, fashion. <clears throat> now, let me say um, wh wh one uh, final point since we're, we're at the end of the time. I, I, do a, a, I think these are posted, right, the PowerPoints. So, so you can go through. I've got some slides on a little bit more elaborate discussion of uh, producer good prices. But let me just uh, say this uh, in uh, closing. If we think now about Apple Inc. Um, producing, deciding now, you know, what, how are we going to arrange our production for the rest of the year? So they, they have all this past knowledge of how markets have unfolded over the year, how many iPhone 10s they sold, how many 
uh, uh, 10 R's and 10 pluses or whatever and so on and so forth, right? All their different product lines. And now they have to make an entrepreneurial judgment as to what, what to produce uh, moving forward. <coughs> What they that that too has certain logical uh, parameters or a, a certain logical character to it. They have to figure out the anticipated additional revenue that any factor production would render in this future period, where they're going to use it to produce something. So they have to think we're going to pay for a computer programmer who's going to you know work on this uh, software, and this is going to enhance the uh, usefulness of uh, this particular iPhone line, and then in you know two months from now, the consumers are going to value that within the matrix of all the other possibilities they have in a certain way that would generate enough revenue to cover that cost. This is a distinctly entrepreneurial uh, activity, right? And then the other thing, the last thing I want to mention on that point is, if the entrepreneurs pay the owners of the factors of production up front. So if they pay their uh, workers right now for goods that will generate revenue months from now, then the uh, entrepreneurs are only willing to pay a upfront a discounted value for uh, having that uh, revenue capacity, right? So so there's an entrepreneurial anticipation in all wages. It's it's uh, entrepreneurial um, expectations that are part of that, and there's also a rate of interest. A discount that uh, exists in all uh, payments for factors of production. So at that point, I'll uh, I'll end. So thank you for your kind attention.